uh, congregation, let's, as we gather uh, together, um, turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Uh, again, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Three verses 5 through 9 as we continue with our series in 2 Timothy. Uh, today's sermon is actually titled Creepers, um, a very odd title, but something to think about. Creepers, creepy. Uh, think about what that means as we go through this passage. And so beginning with verse 5, beginning with verse 5, reading through verse 9, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Uh, Well, a passage like today is something where we might easily dismiss. Um, And and it's because why? You have a passage and talking about false teachers, and then it talks about uh, these sort of weak women, and, and you start to kind of, eh, I'm not a woman, I'm not a teacher, it has nothing to do with me, or I'm not a weak woman, and so it has nothing to do with me, and you just sort of dismiss these few verses. But it's a very good opportunity for us as a warning to really think about uh, these, uh, these warnings that Paul is giving. And so actually to maybe even identify with what the false teachers, the issues with the false teachers, but also with the issues of these, uh, quote, weak women that the ESV translates it as. And we're, we're going to take a look at this. And so uh, what I want us to do is really begin to understand uh, these warnings to help us in dealing with our own sins and dealing with our own attitudes and our own minds as uh, we relate to one another and as we relate to the outside world. And so, again, just kind of think about in verses 1 through 5, you have this language describing uh, these false teachers within the church. And again, it sort of goes back to chapter 2, verse 17 as well, with Hymenaeus and Philetus. There's these false teachers. And so what verses 6 through 9 are doing, we have a passage that's describing really their ministry. Okay, It's describing the way these lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of of pleasure, what they are doing in their ministry. And we see that with verses 6 through 7, describing the ministry of these false teachers, and then with verses 8 through 9, a historical example of what these false teachers are like. And again, because typically it's sort of describing Hymenaeus and Philetus and, and, and these false teachers. It's very easy for us to dismiss it, but I don't want us to do that. I want us to understand and be able to relate and identify with some of the issues that are being described here. And so what Paul does in describing these false teachers, what he does is he says, these guys are creepy. They're creepers, right? The creeps, right? creeps, creepers, creepy. All different ways to describe what these false teachers are doing. And again, you may sit there and you're, I'm not creepy. Right? I'm not a creeper. I don't creep. I know what that means. That's not me. But understand what Paul's doing when he describes here is that these false teachers, what they do is they want to enter into the homes, into the lives of members of the church, and understand who they're targeting. I understand who they're targeting. They're targeting specific people. They're targeting specific people who own these homes. It, now, the ESV says just sort of their households. But you have to understand that it's a very specific, the homes, the homes. And, and the idea is that these are the homes where the church is met. And so these homes where the church is met, uh, it, it sort of, these were the patrons that would help supply the gathering location of the churches. 
And many times they were actually owned by women or by women whose husbands were traveling a lot or these women were widowed. And so a lot of these women, you had these false teachers targeting these women. And so what you're seeing is these women who were wealthy, widowed slash lonely, and they were going after these women, and they were seeking to enter into their lives. And Paul describes these women in very specific ways. He describes them in three ways. And one of the ways, what, the way in which he describes them is, is one, that these women, he says, uh, that they were weak women. Now, you hear that and immediately thinking, okay, weak women. For those of you with the NIV, it actually says that they were weak-willed women. And it almost sounds kind of insulting regarding these women, sort of disparaging of these women. And it sounds like Paul's like, oh, these weak women, these weak-willed women. To give you uh, an idea of some of uh, these other translations, if you have the King James, it says silly women. Oh, these silly women, these, these weak-willed women, these uh, weak women, these, these weak-minded women. It sounds very antagonistic about women. And that's not, the, that's not the point at all what Paul is saying, right? Again, we have to recognize that Paul has a very, very high view of women, and Paul has spoken very highly of women. And you had, in fact, earlier in chapter 1, how did he describe women? He says, hey, Timothy, your mom, your grandma, who had a very, very impactful, impactful role in you becoming a Christian even. So he doesn't have a low opinion of women. Again, think about Phoebe, think about Priscilla. These, these women in the lives of, of, of Paul that had a very significant role in his ministry. So it's not necessarily that it's to be seen as weak-willed, weak-minded. Again, a, a very low view of women, not at all. Instead, what Paul is after, he, what he's doing is he's describing these women uh, in a certain way to help us understand these were actually, this, this wording of, of weak could actually be seen in a way where it's, just, it's, it's translated in some places. It's not found in the Bible, but it's actually translated in a way where it's actually attractive. The word is attractive, not necessarily just in terms of looks, but these were attractive, wealthy, widowed women. And so what that did was it made them very vulnerable. And so the New Living, New Living Translation, or one of the translations, actually describes women as being vulnerable, these women as being vulnerable. They were targets, sought after by predators. They were wealthy, they were widowed, they were or lonely, right? And these women, uh, because they had these homes, these false teachers, what they did was they targeted them. They went after them. Now, what Paul does is, again, he describes a little bit more about these women, and he says that these women, these women, not so much that they were weak-willed, but the fact that they were ridden with past guilt describes them as being weighed down by sins of the past. Right? Maybe they were, uh, again, maybe they were, uh, sins, it doesn't describe what kind of sins, but just simply that there were past sins that weighed them down. And there was a lot of guilt. And you can, you can identify, and, and that's what I want us to do today, is be able to identify with some of that. How much, how much of us, or how many of us, because of sins in the past, were weighed down by guilt? And because we're weighed down by guilt, notice what it says, that they are carried off by their passions. And so kind of the idea here that some people have is, oh, these women with their past sinful deeds or vile sins. And because of their vile sins, they allow their passions to kind of lead them away. And these women, they're weak-minded, and so uh, they're always searching for the truth, but they can never find it. It sounds like it could be translated that way, and that's not the point that Paul's making at all. Instead, again, what he's saying is that these are women that have been burdened by their sins. And it's not, uh, it's, it, it's not restricted to just women. I think any of us. There are sins that we have done, sins that, or sins that we haven't done, or, or things that we haven't done in our sins. And it causes a tremendous guilt. And because of that, we want to try and redeem ourselves. 
We've done foolish things in the past, and we want to sort of redeem ourselves. And so what it does is it allows our passions. Now, that word passions, it's the same word, again, that we've been bumping up against again and again. It's that word epidesire. It's that massive desire that is able to lead us away. Right? It's, it's that desire. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily sinful. It's just a desire that we have. Oh, I desire a good thing. I desire a good thing. I want to be a very rep- reputable person. But that desire to be reputable can be so great that I just want to be well-liked. And so it allows people uh, to, to I'm, I'm so worried about the opinions of other people. And so what happens is that epi desire of being reputable becomes so great that all you're doing is trying to be well-liked by others. And so it leads you astray. See, that guilt that has become so strong on these women, what's happened is they have this desire to sort of maybe redeem themselves even. Instead of understanding the grace and forgiveness of Christ, because these guilty feelings of the past is overwhelming them, what it's done is it's allowed them to be taken away by their reputation, the desire to be reputable, their desire to have a good name, their desire for for this or that, good things, but it's allowed them to be led astray. And you see these wicked teachers see that, grab a hold of that, the vulnerability of these women And they start taking them away. See, these are women who are constantly trying to learn. They they want to rectify this, but they're not coming to the truth, essentially because it's failing to understand ultimately that grace and mercy, the forgiveness of Christ. And I think that's something that we all struggle with. There are sins in our lives. We feel guilty about something. And in order to rectify that, in order to redeem ourselves, we allow certain things to lead us away. We're constantly searching and trying to rectify. What can I do to rectify this? What can I do to redeem myself, to to take care of this? And sadly, because of that, we ourselves find, uh, find ourselves to be vulnerable. That can be led astray very easily, very quickly. It's failing to understand that grace and mercy that these false teachers are not teaching. And Paul is very, very concerned about this situation. But that's not the only issue. Now, why do you think that these men, that these teachers, are targeting these vulnerable women? See, these teachers see these women... And they understand what's happening. But ultimately, again, why are they looking after them? These women who are wealthy and widowed. Ultimately, because think about why would they target them? Why, are not they, why not target poor women who have nothing to offer? See, that's not what's being described here. It is women who have something to offer these men. In other words, think of it this way. Why be targeted? How can I benefit from these other people? See, it's all about one thing with these false teachers. How can I benefit from my association with them? You see, they look, they're looking at these women. They're targeting these women primarily for one and one reason. And that's going to explain verses 8 and 9 and, and this mentioning of Janus and Jambres. They are targeting these women because of the benefit they will receive. I think that's something, again, we can really think about for ourselves. Why do we want to associate with certain people? Whether it's within the church or outside of the church, why do we want to associate with certain people? Why do we want to associate with wealthy people? Well, what can I benefit? My networking, rubbing elbows, whatever words you want to use to that. Why do you want to associate with good-looking people? Well, maybe some of that good look, it means that I'm good-looking. 
Why do you want to associate with younger people? Well, you know, I can sort of boss them around. Why do you want to associate with older people? Well, it's kind of easy to take advantage of older people. Why do you want to associate with certain kinds of people? Again, how is it that it might benefit you? And that's what we're seeing with these false teachers. It's all about how can I benefit from this? How can I benefit from that relationship? How can I benefit from my association with them? How can I benefit? How will I be lifted up? How will I be brought up? How will I be raised? And that's our goal. And Paul's warning Timothy and the church. Is that what the church is? Is that why the church exists? Because it's all about how I might benefit from my association. How I might benefit. See, this is why Paul then goes on in verses 8 through 9 to describe the situation with Janus and Jambres. Now, for those of you who read this and you're like, oh, hmm, that sounds familiar. Oh, isn't that in the Old Testament? And, and start searching in your Bibles and start looking around and you begin to realize, wait, there is no Janus and Jambres. There's no one in the Old Testament named Janus and Jambres. And you'll quickly find out where did this come from? Who's Paul talking about? Who opposed Moses? Who opposed Moses that, that, that's named Janus and Jambres? Right? Who are these people? Well, this is a case where Paul is actually using oral tradition, or, or you might even say rabbinic tradition. And what rabbinic tradition means, like rabbis and, and uh, sort of that's been passed down throughout uh, Jewish uh, culture. Sort of in the same way that, oh yeah, didn't uh, George Washington cut down a cherry tree and didn't lie about it or something, something like that, right? It's one of those oral traditions, those stories that you hear down the road. And this is one of those traditions, these stories that have been told throughout the culture of, of, of uh, Jewish culture. And so what he does is Paul names these two figures, and, and Janus and Jambers are actually the two magicians in Exodus 7 that oppose Moses. They side with Pharaoh. Okay, they side with Pharaoh, and what happens is, is they then go against Moses, go against Aaron. And, and you find that uh, the plagues, the ten plagues, and they're the magicians that are trying to mimic the miracles that Aaron and Moses are doing. And they're going up against, again, going up against Moses, going up against God on the side of Pharaoh. Ultimately, then they go and they say, you know what, we can't even copy this anymore. It's too much. So in the beginning, they're working on the side of Pharaoh, opposing Moses, opposing God. And then ultimately, what do they do? They say, we can't imitate this. We can't do what they're doing. It's impossible. And then it turns out some of the writings about Janus and Jambres, you know what's, what's said about them is that they actually join Israel and go with them through the exodus. You hear that, you're like, oh, man, that's good. That's a good thing. And then you realize, maybe that wasn't so good. Because other writings begin to describe Janice's and Jambres' ministry. They're actually supposed to be the guys who are helping Aaron, leading Israel to establish golden calves in Exodus 32 and 33. They're also the guys, they say, that were helping Balaam uh, and his donkey in opposing, again, God's servants, God's prophets at that time as well. Janice and Jambres, in other words, even though they came with Israel in the Exodus, you begin to find out they were not actually helpful people. And they were doing so much to upend Israel, upend Israel's ministry. And so then you got to ask yourselves, why did they leave in the first place? Why did they leave Egypt in the first place? And you begin to realize, wait a minute. Oh, they saw the power of Moses. They saw the power of God. And they decided, you know what? This is a good time to jump ship and leave Egypt and go along with Israel. Israel's got a lot of power. This God of theirs has a lot of power. In other words, we see a historic example of two guys that jumped ship, that left Egypt, not because they saw 
the salvation of God, the power of God in salvation. But what they saw was, how will we benefit? How can we benefit from our association with this Yahweh figure? How can we benefit from our association with Israel? How can we benefit from this? And so what Paul does is he says, here are two guys like Hamanaeus and Philetus in chapter 2. Here are two guys that we see in the history, in the history of the church going back with Israel. Two examples of figures who jump ship. Why? For their benefit, for their association, how they might be lifted up, how they might be raised up. And Paul is warning Timothy, is that what the Ephesian church is about? He's warning Timothy, is that what Ephesus is about? The church at Ephesus is about, and this is a warning, I think, that we can also embrace and ask ourselves, is that what Theophilus is about? Our association with Reformed theology, our association with the OPC, which, by the way, today marks the 26th year of God's faithfulness of Theophilus' existence? Is our association all about how we might benefit? Is our association with this congregation all about how I might benefit? How I might be served? How I might be raised up? Or is my association about how I might serve in this proper motivation, in this proper way? Paul is confronting Timothy. Paul is, is bringing, he's not bringing this out to Timothy simply to say, hey, you know what? You know those guys? Those are really bad dudes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not good guys. This isn't meant for gossip fodder with Timothy. This is meant to warn Timothy and the Ephesian church, get your act together. Get your act together because you need to ask yourselves, what is my association here? Why am I associated here? To be benefited from? to be raised up in order to be exalted and glorified? Because this is exactly the opposite, the opposite in what I want us to understand and realize when we are coming to the table today. We are seeing visible representation, visible representation of exactly the opposite of Janus and Jambres. We are seeing visible representation of exactly the opposite of Hymenaeus and Philetus. We are seeing exactly what Paul wants Timothy and the Ephesian church to understand and embrace. Because here, when we see the Lord's table and we see the bread and the wine, do you know what we see? We see someone who did not seek to exalt his name. Instead, we see someone who did not do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility counted others more significant than himself. And that's exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 at the, when he's in jail at that time. And he says in verse 4, let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Becoming a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He humbled himself to be a servant, even to the point of dying. Even to the point of dying, that he would serve with that kind of humility. See, Paul is exposing the arrogance He's exposing in these false teachers, he's exposing in the Ephesian church a real problem. A church that isn't dissimilar to the kind of church we have. An extremely multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi because of where they're located in Ephesus. A church that might not be that different from what we would see today. Middle class, upper middle class in the suburbs in some ways, right? Exactly what we see and hear Paul is saying, no, is your association simply because it might benefit you? Because that's not what Christ did. Do you think Christ benefited from his association with us? 
Do you think his association with us would somehow make him more exalted? Does he see you and look at you and say, wow, you know, that's a person that I want to be with. I, I got to be with because he's just going to raise my game. He's going to raise me up. By associating with that person, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel a lot better about myself. That's not the case with Christ. And that's exactly what Paul wants the Ephesian church to understand. When we come to the table and we look at the bread and the wine, do you see with the bread and wine somebody who emptied himself, gave his life, not seeking out how he might benefit, not seeking out any kind of selfish ambition or conceit, but out of love and humility gave himself for you. See, Paul says in verse 9 that this sort of motivation is going to get exposed. That sort of motivation is going to get exposed. It always gets exposed. And yet look at Christ. Was that motivation ever exposed? Did he somehow do this selfishly? Not at all. But he saw the benefit it would have for you. That you would receive salvation. That you would have a place a seat at the table in heaven. He saw what you would have, and he emptied his life. He emptied his life for you. And that is a life that we are called to live, no less. That life of emptying ourselves, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of others, because that's exactly what God did for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that once again we're reminded of your goodness, your grace, your mercy to us. I mean, what benefit could we possibly give to you? I mean, what did you see in us that you would say, oh, you, you, that somehow you really need us? Lord, how humbling it is to know, again, it is by your mercy, your grace. And we see with the Lord's table that visible representation of what it means that you gave your life to benefit us. Not for your own benefit, but to benefit us, to raise us up. To raise us up, you had to lower yourself. And so, Lord, we pray that we might live that life of lowering ourselves, lowering ourselves for the sake of your people, Lowering ourselves for the sake of those who don't hear, who don't know the gospel, so that they might hear the gospel. That we might really understand what it means not to be prideful, but to be humble. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.